Madonna Drake, whose real name was Eunice Westmoreland, was born on November 15, 1914. In the 1930s and 1940s, she was an American singer, dancer, and actress. By ancestry, Drake was a mixed race. Under the names Una Novella and Rita Novella, she frequently identified as Mexican and was frequently cast in ethnic white parts that included Middle Eastern and Latin American characters. In the early 1940s, Mexican Rita Rio led a traveling all-girl orchestra that was also known by the titles Dona Drake and her girl band for her dance and musical performances. Because she kept a dark, deep secret to herself, Dona Drake chose to hide her identity from the public. In addition to keeping her name a secret from the public, she was involved in a scandal in 1936. The FBI questioned her regarding the passing of Louis Amberg, a well-known mobster and her boyfriend at the time. She added that all she knew about him was that he was Mr. Cohen and nothing more. Dona Drake was also involved in another event in which she and her spouse tried to hide one another from the public, a move that ultimately backfired. Well then, let's dig deep into her career, personal life, and controversial past. We'll also look at why she kept escaping the world and changing her identity and don't forget to tell us in the comments section who you would like us to talk about next time. What do you do when it rains? What do you do when it pours? What do you do when it pours? Entering show business in the 1930s, she used the names Una Velen, Rita Rio, and Rita Shaw. She began performing in 1932, working under the name Una Villon as a chorus girl and in nightclubs. As Una Villon, she appeared in Earl Carroll's Vanities in 1933 prompting Paul Harrison to write in a review printed in the Indiana Gazette, most noteworthy newcomer is Miss Una Vion who sings, dances, and looks like a 16-year-old incarnation of Anne Pennington. Only a couple of days before the premiere, she was hired away from a Broadway nightclub and already has proved her right to a place in the big-time spotlight. In 1934, columnist Walter Winchell wrote about her performance in a nightclub, Una Vion's torso shifting serves to synchronize the tempos instead of Barron's directing, this young lady directs the tutors with her wiggling. She began using the name Rita Rio in 1935, when she was featured at the Paradise Cabaret on Broadway. Besides singing and dancing, she sometimes played piano, trumpet, clarinet, saxophone and drums and occasionally led the orchestra. In 1936, she and another woman formed an orchestra. After the group had financial problems in 1940, she went to Hollywood, where she had screen tests using the name Rita Shaw. She settled on the stage name Dona Drake in the early 1940s. Studio publicity during her heyday incorrectly stated that Drake was of Mexican origin and was born Rita Novella borrowing her mother's first name as a new last. Her striking, angular features and dark curly hair led her to being cast as an ethnic character such as a Latina, Middle Easterner, American Indian, or Gypsy. She is perhaps best known for playing the American Indian maid of Betty Davis in Beyond the Forest. She also appeared as the Arab girl Naherma opposite Bob Hope and Bing Crosby in Road to Morocco in 1942. In 1944, she appeared as a lead role as a big band singer in a B-movie titled Hot Rhythm, which also featured Irene Ryan as a ditzy secretary. Drake had a notable, non-ethnic, non-musical role as the second female lead in the 1949 comedy The Girl from Jones Beach, playing opposite Eddie Bracken. The year before, she gave a memorable comic performance as the fortune-hunting sister in So This Is New York. In the early 1940s, Drake toured the United States with an all-girl orchestra called The Girlfriends, which included fellow Hollywood actresses Marie Wilson, Toby Wing, and Faith Bacon. In 1944, Travilla met and married starlet Dona Drake, who at the time was more famous than he was having been in the entertainment industry for 11 years under several different names. Donna Drake, born Eunice Westmoreland on November 5, 1914 to Joseph and Novella Westmoreland in Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville was a major port on the East Coast shipping lanes and due to its balmy weather, a vacation destination for Northerners seeking to escape the cold winters. 
From 1907 until 1918, it also 30 permanent film studios, known as the winter film capital of the world and where Oliver Hardy got his start and until politicians plus other factors forced the filmmakers to California was a leading industry in the city. Life was good for most of Jacksonville's residents, but not for the Westmorelands as segregation was strictly enforced and though Dona claimed Latin heritage throughout her personal and professional career, referred to as such in both 1920 and 1930 census records. Both parents were interchangeably referred to as Negro and Mulatto in the early 1900 censuses. By 1930, Eunice's family has relocated to Philadelphia with her father working in a chili parlor and her older brother enrolled in college. Eunice helped at the restaurant but soon quit to pursue her lifelong dream of singing and dancing. By 1933, she had moved to New York City with her mother and another waitress named Renee Villian. Changing her name to Una, she and Renee formed a sister act and the pair found work at the Paradise Club on Broadway. Earl Carroll spotted her on stage one night and cast her in his production of Murder at the Vanities. When that ended, the girls toured until Renee left to get married and Una continued solo, performing in package tours headed by Rudy Valley and Harry Richmond. Returning to New York City, Una began dating a local Brooklyn mobster named Pretty Amberg. In October of 1934, Amberg's nude body was found in the trunk of a burning car. At the time, Una was in Hollywood with a new name, Rita Rio, and filming her first movie, Strike Me Pink with Eddie Cantor. Rita came back to New York and got a AA job at the N.T. Grantland Hollywood restaurant. Filling in for the owner one night, Rita did so well as the mistress of ceremonies that she was given the position full-time. And when someone came up with the idea of forming a girls' band as an advertising promotion, Rita was the natural choice as its conductor. And what started out as a gimmick turned into a very successful career. Rita Rio and her NBC all-girl orchestra was comprised of 12 talented young women gathered from around the world, including several from university sororities and a couple from Europe. After a three-month stint on the NBC radio network, the group began a nationwide bus tour performing its fine dance rhythms and its entertaining specialties and clever singing and dancing numbers of Rita Rio. Appearing at Atlantic City's famed Steel Pier and opposite K. Kaiser in Chicago before finding themselves in Hollywood where the girls filmed a series of musical shorts called Soundies, which were the original MTV videos created for theaters. Though the material is rather hokey, Rita's talents are blatantly obvious performing such songs as Feed the Kitty and a duet with then-unknown actor Alan Ladd. She also appeared in very small roles in three films before in early 1940 again taking the act on the road with actresses Marie Wilson and Toby Wing, plus Earl Carroll Vanity's girl Faith Bacon joining the all-girl, all-glamour Hollywood oomph. With Rita Rio, the mistress of modern melody, and her Rhythm in Scales review, they again traveled across the United States, making numerous appearances for the Infantile Paralysis Fund and Tuberculosis Campaign. By the time Rita returned to Hollywood, she was Rita Novella, her mother's first name, then later becomes Rita Shaw when she screen-tested twice for Paramount's Aloma of the South Seas as Dorothy Lamour's sarong-wearing best friend. Lamour knew Rita from New York City and recommended her to the film's producer, Buddy De Silva. Upon signing her to contract, the studio changes her name to Dona, pronounced as in Don, you want a drink. Drake and begins the big publicity buildup for its newest starlet. Newspaper articles and mentions in the gossip columns soon spread her photograph and statistics across the country. According to Paramount, she was 5 feet tall, weighed 90 pounds, was 20 years old, actually 26, had blue-green eyes, chestnut hair, and was of half Mexican and a quarter each Irish and French. As with Frady Washington in 1934's Imitation of Life and several other black females whose skin tones and facial features enabled them to pass for white such as Lena Horne, Dona would have to deny her family heritage to succeed in the entertainment industry because at the time and for many years after, the studios felt the movie going public wouldn't accept, and unfortunately they were correct, an attractive black actress. No matter how talented in any role but that of a servant or comedic. Sidekick. 
Certainly not as the romantic lead opposite a white actor, even Hollywood knew the rest of the country paid its salaries. After Aloma, Dona appeared in Luisana Purchase and then in the 1942 Bob Hope slash Bing Crosby classic Road to Morocco. Along with numerous appearances in the many of the Hollywood gossip columns published across the nations thanks to the studio's publicity buildup, Drake performed in Hollywood nightclubs between film assignments as well as helping the war effort boosting soldier moral by appearing on the covers of such publications as Yank and the Army Weekly. She was also named by Alpha Epsilon Pi of George's Emory College as the girl they'd like to have in the back seat of a car without gas and no ration book. In 1943, after only two more film appearances and soon after a column blurb of Drake writing and starring in a film about an all-girls orchestra, Paramount dropped her contract in the summer and Donna found herself a free agent in a company town. But that didn't bother her as it was wonderful at first. I thought I was on my way to becoming a film actress. But you can't make a screen career out of combing Lamore's hair or chasing Bob Hope in one picture after another. When I would tell this to Mr. De Silva, who was always very nice to me, he would tell me just to be patient that my turn was coming. As for the rumblings that Dona was not an actress, she simply stated, of course, I'm not an actress. But other studios thought I was worth borrowing for good parts and made an offer for me, all of which Paramount turned down. You know perfectly well that you don't have to be an actress to go over in pictures. Among girls my age, how many are there on the screen who can act? The secret of off-screen success is largely a matter of a good part and a good director. He's the guy who holds your fate in his hands. Even Betty Davis can go sour without a good director while one who knows his business can make most any average girl look as if she really had talent. It was while she was filming 1944's Hot Rhythm at Monogram Pictures that friend Joan Blondell introduced her to William Travilla. It was a very quick romance as 10 days later, on August 19, 1944, they married at Santa Monica City Hall. The bride was dressed in a plaid cotton shirt, a pair of Levis, a bandana headdress with an orchid corsage supplied by her fiancé. Though Travilla joked that my wife turned down a $5,000 a week contract in Las Vegas because now she had a husband to support her. Asterisk, Dona continued her career through the marriage. Of course, they were ethnic or secondary roles with John Wayne and Claudette Colbert in Without Reservations and Betty Davis in Beyond the Forest as her exotic heritage was still the truth but for a more important reason now. Interracial marriage was not only frowned upon but illegal in most of the United States at the time and illiberal Hollywood could not escape the clutches of bigotry and ignorance. Even the announcement in the newspapers led off with how Drake had kept the marriage a secret for almost a month. Definitely the more famous of the pair, Dona's name usually led the mentions in the press with Dona Drake and William Travilla seen dining at. Or Dainty Dona, the girl from Jones Beach. Also revealed to Travilla was that Dona suffered from a mild form of epilepsy and later surfaced emotional difficulties that Travilla later described diplomatically. She was one of those actresses who found it hard to come home and step out of the character she'd been playing all day. However, some joy came into the couple's life when daughter Nia Novella was born in August 1951, three days before the couple's seventh wedding anniversary. Even with a daughter, Donna continued to work, appearing in several films and an episode of television's Superman with her final screen appearance in Princess of the Nile, for which her husband designed her costumes. After four appearances on television in 1955, Dona Drake retired from the entertainment industry for good. The couple separated in 1956, but never divorced. Travilla moved out, but returned for extended periods of time, or at least kept up the appearance as the press reported on the loving family with both he and Dona appearing on an episode of Groucho Marx's You Bet Your Life. Dona appeared in many of Travilla's fashion shows as the perfect example of Travilla's skill at designing for women of all shapes and sizes, but her emotional problems had gotten to the point that by 1967, she sent Nia to live with her father. 
The late 70s saw her health begin to falter and after one final appearance as herself at the 1986 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade on June 20, 1989, Donna D. Travilla passed away at 74 from pneumonia and respiratory failure. She was cremated and her ashes scattered at sea.